A very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, welcome to this penultimate CELS uh, seminar. Um, at this point in the academic year, today's speaker uh, does not really need an introduction. Uh, professor Eleanor Sharpston KC is the good heart professor of the Faculty of Law here in the University of Cambridge and has been a tremendous colleague to all of us uh, inside the Center for European Legal Studies, but also beyond. And I see many uh, of her students here today, so a special welcome to all of you. Uh, on behalf of the CELS directors, it's my absolute pleasure to present to you uh, Professor Sharpston. She uh, was not uh, just a colleague and fellow of King's College uh, here in Cambridge. Uh, she was also a very eminent member of the European Bar in London and then became Advocate General in the court, uh, 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 a position that she filled with great distinction. Many of us in this room supervise EU law and uh, this week and, and next week in particular feature two of her most prominent advocate uh, general opinions. If you haven't read them, please do. Um, I told my students that if they wanted to see a first class uh, Cambridge essay, they should read some of Eleanor Sharpston's opinion. Uh, they are superbly crafted and just fantastic to read. Um, Eleanor, Leo, it has been a real pleasure to have you here as good head professor um, all year. I hope the university in its wisdom uh, takes good note of that. And uh, yeah, maybe there's uh, more to come. Um, for those who are joining us today online, please ask your questions in the Q and A uh, button. Um, it, uh, the questions will be made available to Professor Sharpston and we'll select a few questions first from the room and then from online. Leo. Thank you, Marcus. If that's the short version of the introduction, I'd be really embarrassed to hear the long one. Thank you for those very kind words. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to you and greetings very much to the uh, friends and interested people who I'm sure are future friends who are online. I'm about to demonstrate whether I am challenged in computer terms by seeing if I can enable captions because somebody has just requested that I should do that. I will enable the captions, but it will come with my usual health and safety warning on it, which is that I do not check the captions which are added by artificial intelligence to what I say. And therefore, I assume no responsibility, express, implied, or anything else for what turns up in the captions. I do assume responsibility for what I say, but not for what the chat bot thinks that I said. So, against that background, I gave today's seminar a slightly provocative title because I said of hijabs and shechita or halal, depending on whether you're Jewish or Muslim, does the Court of Justice of the European Union, and maybe even, heaven forfend, maybe even the European Court of Human Rights, have a blind spot about non-Christian religions? And I want, to, I want to set the scene a little bit to start with. I mean, as we know, Societies change, times change, laws and courts change with them. If we go back into history, there's nothing strange about finding people of different religions wearing different garments very publicly, whether because they chose to or because they were told to sew a Star of David onto their clothing. Uh, we wouldn't want to go back to everything that was happening at that stage. But I think one of the points I have to highlight at the beginning is that we've moved from a situation where 
whether you were discriminated against because of your religion or not, everyone accepted that your religion was a very central part of your existence. Nobody thought of a Christian or of a Jew or of a Muslim that somehow their faith was peripheral to their person, on the contrary. And it's therefore because the perception of religion has changed, because it is no longer in Western Europe regarded as something that is a central value, it is no longer necessarily taken for granted that one's private and one's public self are inseparable. There is a sort of assumption, I think I would say, and I hope I will demonstrate, there is a sort of assumption that religion is about one's moral conduct, obviously, but that it is exclusively about one's moral conduct. And that there are some, some trappings of religion which can be disregarded if there is another important competing value. One of my abiding memories as the first of the hijab cases came to the court, and I was walking down the corridor with the reporting judge, the very nice Luxembourgish judge, Judge Francois Bilchen de France, was a Francois reaching inside his shirt, finding the gold chain around his neck, there's one around my neck too, and then kind of waving it at me and saying, Eleanor, I mean, as you know, I'm a practicing Catholic, and I wear a cross around a little crucifix around my neck, but it's inside my shirt. Why can't people just be sensible and, you know, practice their religion, but be discreet about it? I wonder how you wear a Death Star, a Sikh turban, discreetly. I mean, I'd really like to know how you wear it discreetly, because it seems to me that you either wear your Death Star with pride and conviction and commitment, or you do not wear a Death Star. But I cannot see how you could find some way of wearing it that would be a discreet manifestation of the fact that you were Sikh. Something else that we really need to get out there at the beginning is the confusion, the possible confusion, between proselytizing, taking one's religion and stuffing it down other people's throats, and the ordinary manifestation of one's religion because this is my religion and it's important to me. There is, of course, a rise of other competing values, as we'll see. There's animal welfare. There's the idea that the public administration should be secular, should be neutral, laïcité, as it's called in French. There's the employer's desire to run a profitable business and to enhance his bottom line by carefully avoiding giving offense to any potential customer, so he would like to be neutral. And of course, religions also change their position in relation to the outside world. I'm going to take a historical example from the Jewish Enlightenment, Pascala, as promoted by the Maskilim. You find the moment where instead of everyone keeping every last tenet of very orthodox Judaism, you have the new motto be a Jew in your tent, but be an ordinary man in the street. So, you know, you have your religion and it's very important to you, but you shouldn't be wearing it literally or figuratively on your sleeve. And there is a tacit assumption that if you want equality in employment, then rigorously equal treatment is enough to get you to where you want to get. So as I go into the detail of the cases, just please let's remember, we're not here, we are not talking about a patriarchal fundamentalist society forcing women to cover up against their will. We're not talking about Afghanistan under the Taliban. We are talking about educated women who choose to 
have as part of their observant Muslim faith that they dress discreetly. The Quran doesn't say you have to wear a hijab, by the way, but it does enjoin modesty and the obvious and traditional and accepted way of being modest if you're not going to go into the more elaborate and more covering garments like uh, burqas, the obvious thing to do is to wear a hijab. And let's remember also, we've just lived through the COVID pandemic. We've spent two years with people going around with their faces covered, all right? We were all wearing masks. During COVID, you'd have seen me, my eyes, and then you'd have seen one of the you know personal protective equipment. If you're wearing a hijab, your face is open, clear, visible to the person you're talking to. So everything in communication which we rely upon in Western democracies, reading the face as well as listening to the words, all of that is available because the hijab is just going to go around there and cover the hair, framing the face. So we're not talking about a patriarchal society, we're talking about free choice. We are not talking about proselytizing for any religion. What we are talking about in both the hijab cases and the shahita, the halal cases, what we are talking about is observant practitioners who are following religious laws, traditional customs that are an integral part of their religious observance. They're not add-on extras, they're part of who these people are. And when I say these people, uh, I should say, because it's always helpful to know where the speaker is coming from, I should say that I am religious, and I should probably also say that since my two parents belong to different religions, I grew up on the fault line between two different religions, which perhaps makes me a little bit more aware of the issues of non-Christian religions than if I had been brought up in a purely Christian household. Now, now to the hijab cases. The hijab cases have not been helped by an identification by the court's weird habit of deciding it's going to change the names so that we no longer necessarily have the name of the plaintiff. The first two cases concerning the hijab were case 15715, which when it was going through was known as Ajbita, the name of the lady in question, Ajbita against G4S Solutions. If you look up Ajbita now on the court's database, you'll get zero results. You have to remember to look it up under the name of the defendant. Uh, by the way, I do have a case list for this, and I will talk to the organizers afterwards. And if I ask them nicely, they might put up in an accessible way for everyone the list of the case names and the references, uh, because most of the names are either unpronounceable or partly pronounceable. And it's, you know, it just will be easier for everyone if you have the list. So there was Ajpita, and that was a reference from... Belgium, about a lady who was working for a security firm for G4S. And at the same time, slightly later in case number, and therefore Ajbita was treated as the lead case, that this will become important. Uh, slightly later was case C18815, Bugnawi, and the Association pour la Défense des Droits de l'Homme, against Metropol. Now, usually, if you have two cases that come to the court more or less at the same time and the subject matter is the same, they get allocated to the same reporting judge and the same advocate general because there's an efficiency in terms of judicial resources. Uh, the Bugnawi case, by the way, was about a female graduate who was a software engineer. And she worked within the firm, but she was also somehow sometimes sent out to work at a client company. And after one such posting out to do some work, her employers received a letter from the client company saying that they felt kind of awkward and unfortunate, uncomfortable about having this woman in a hijab. Pas de voile la prochaine fois. Please, no hijab next time. 
and that reference came from France. Please note, since we mentioned the word France, this isn't about laïcité as such. That applies in the context of the public administration. This was a private company employing somebody who wore a hijab. Actually, both Ms. Achbita and Ms. Budawi had originally, but you know, one's level of religious observance does vary. I find that myself. Uh, originally, they hadn't been hijab wearing. And then at a certain moment, they decided that actually they felt more comfortable in their faith, in fact, wearing a hijab. Level of observance went up. Problem came with it. The two cases did go to the same reporting judge, to François Bilchen, but the first advocate general allocated them to different advocates general. Curiously, they went to who were at that time the only two female advocate general, and also to the court's two longest serving advocates general in the shape of Juliana Kokart and myself. Juliana got Echbita and I got Bugnawi. We have different methods of working. Juliana is very, very kind of thorough and ahead of the game, and she likes to have everything sorted out really before the hearing. She then sits and listens politely in the hearing, and then the draft opinion goes over to translation. I have never managed to work like that. I really, really need intellectually the stimulus of the hearing in order to go on thinking through the ideas, thinking through the nuances, wondering how I'm going to call things particularly in a case where you have competing fundamental rights. And so Juliana's opinion came out first. And in her opinion, she said that what had happened with Ms. Ajbita wasn't direct discrimination. It was maybe indirect discrimination, but in any event, it was entirely justifiable because essentially you should leave your religion outside the door when you go into work. You know, it's fine to have your religion, but it shouldn't get in the way of you being an employee. And for almost three months, the Grand Chamber thought it really didn't have a problem. And then Sharpston produced her opinion. And my opinion was diametrically different from Juliana's opinion. Let's just say that. I do actually recommend if you want to try to start understanding the issues, do begin by reading those two opinions. Because in terms of two analyses of the same problem, it's very interesting how far apart we were. Uh, I would say the, the questions referred were not identical in the two cases. Uh, in my case, the core question was whether you could regard it as a genuine occupational requirement not to wear a hijab. And if you think about it for a minute, if you're a software engineer, it's rather difficult to see why it would be a genuine occupational requirement that you not go along to the client wearing your hijab. I mean, you have to work on it to get to the idea it would be a genuine occupational requirement. So we came up with two radically different perspectives, like two cats who put their tails up in the air and walk off in opposing directions. And then the Grand Chamber had to try to reconcile the two. And it found itself doing the splits. And I don't think, to be very frank and very critical, I do not think that it made much of a job in the first cases in Ajbita and Bugnawi of managing to reconcile the irreconcilable. What it said in Ajbita was that Article 22A of Directive 2070-80C, establishing a general framework for equal treatment in employment and occupation, <coughs> was to be interpreted as meaning that the prohibition on wearing an Islamic headscarf, which arises from an internal rule of a private undertaking, prohibiting the visible wearing of any political, philosophical, or religious sign in the workplace, does not constitute direct discrimination based on religion or belief within the meaning of that directive. By contrast, such an internal rule of a private undertaking may constitute indirect discrimination within the meaning of Article 22b if it is established that the apparently neutral obligation it imposes results, in fact, in persons adhering to a particular religion or belief being put at a particular disadvantage unless it is objectively justified by a legitimate aim 
such as the pursuit by the employer in its relations with its customers of a policy of political, philosophical, and religious neutrality. And the means of achieving that aim are appropriate and necessary, which it is for the referring court to ascertain. In the judgment, the courts have been dropping very heavy hints that actually this was probably okay. And in this judgment, the court really does seem to accept that you put on an equal footing political, philosophical, or religious signs. I'll point out that the directive does not grant protection to all those three. And the Achbita judgment also makes a pretty heavy hint that if you are an intelligent employer, so you organize it so that your rule looks very neutral and you say sweetly that you apply it to everyone, well, that should be okay because you are allowed to put your business profit motive ahead of the religious beliefs of your employees. In Bugnawi, the same court, trying to get to a sensible answer, tried to say that the facts of Bugnawi were perhaps the same as Achbita, except by the way they weren't. Uh, but then it went on to say, well, if to the extent that actually we're not talking, we're not really talking about a rule that is, is applied to everyone, maybe it wasn't quite, maybe there wasn't a policy in place before the famous letter arrived from the customer. So if that's the situation, then we may need to look at it a bit more carefully. And yes, we would actually need to look at whether this was a genuine and determining occupational requirement that you shouldn't wear a hijab. And so the court was given some, well, national court was given some fairly muddled guidance, except that the court did manage to get to the answer to the question by saying that Article 4.1 of the directive must be interpreted as meaning that the willingness of an employer to take account of the wishes of a customer no longer to have the services of that employer provided by a worker wearing an Islamic headscarf cannot be considered a genuine and determining occupational requirement. So they sort of tried to get to the answer they wanted in each case, but it is very difficult as an intellectual exercise to work out exactly how you mesh Ajbita and Bugnawi. I'm not the only person to think that. There were a lot of very puzzled national courts as a follow-up to that. And in due course, the court got some further references. Very specifically, it got a new set of cases. Uh, it got a case called VABA, case 804-18, and another case called Müller, case C341-19. Uh, Varber was about somebody teaching in a school. Uh, Miller was about somebody working in a pharmacy. This was the moment at which I got defenestrated from the court. Uh, so I had worked with my team on preparing for the hearings in that case, those two cases. All of this is Grand Chamber stuff. Every case I'm going to talk to you about is Grand Chamber with the sole exception of one religious clothing case which wasn't difficult and went to a chamber of five, but every single other case I'm mentioning is grand chamber, which tells you something. And do look at the AG's opinions because the AG does not always go the same way as the court in these cases that I'm talking about. Vaba and Miller, my team and I had done a lot of work. They were set down for hearing, then there was COVID, the hearings got postponed, then other cases got restored to the list to be heard, Vaba and Müller were kept in the deep freeze until after I had been ejected from the court. They were then reallocated immediately to my successor advocate, General Rantos, and very early in his mandate, he had the two cases in the Grand Chamber. He also did not have anyone working for him. There was no continuity because he didn't take people in my team on to work with him. So there was no continuity in terms of the AG's thinking between the earlier cases and what was coming through the pipeline. 
whereas the original purpose had been precisely that the state, you know, there would be continuity. My team and I were, I think, rather, rather tediously stubborn individuals because we really didn't like being stripped of our nice case in this way. And thanks to my team, I do emphasize thanks to my team because I could never have done this on my own. A little while after Advocate General Rantos published his opinion saying that what the employers in those cases was doing was all just fine, I published a shadow opinion, which Professor Steve Pierce kindly put up on the web. So it was up there and out there, developing what I had been saying earlier in Bugnawi. And I, I mean, I hope, uh, and really thanks to the work that my team put into this with me, providing a slightly more nuanced analysis of what the competing weights and values were and how you might try to reconcile them. So the court then has another go, has another go at the problem, and it goes into uh, Mueller and, and, and Vaba. It produces slightly more nuanced answers. What it does is to say that internal rules which prohibit workers from wearing any visible sign of political, philosophical, or religious beliefs in the workplace, an internal rule like that does not constitute, with regard to workers who observe certain clothing rules based on religious precepts, direct discrimination. is not direct discrimination, provided that that rule is applied in a general and undifferentiated way, in an in undifferentiated way. So that's the first limb, that's Article 22A, the directive. Under 22B, they slightly further nuance what's going on because the ruling then becomes a difference of treatment indirectly based on religion or belief arising from an internal rule of an undertaking prohibiting workers from wearing any visible sign of political, philosophical, or religious beliefs in the workplace may be justified by the employer's desire to pursue a policy of political, philosophical, and religious neutrality with regards to its customers or users, provided first that that policy meets a genuine need on the part of that employer, which is, is for that employer to demonstrate taking into consideration in Terralia the legitimate wishes of those customers or users and the adverse consequences that that employer would suffer in the absence of that policy, given the nature of its activities and the context in which they're carried out. I'm gonna make a break there in order to comment. We've managed to move from Beta, which just says, you know, if the employer wants to be neutral, that's fine by us to saying, well, if you want to be neutral, you do have to show actually why being neutral is necessary, why, why it's important to your business. It's not just a rubber stamp. Secondly, that that difference in treat of treatment is appropriate for the purpose of ensuring that the employer's policy of neutrality is properly implied, which entails that that policy is pursued in a consistent and systematic manner. So you can't have a neutral policy which isn't, in fact, a neutral policy, right? And thirdly, you're still with me, thirdly, thirdly, that the prohibition in question is limited to what is strictly necessary having regard to the actual scale and severity of the adverse consequences that the employer is seeking to avoid by adopting that prohibition. And it's only all these rules about internal rules prohibiting wearing of visible signs, they can be justified only if the prohibition covers all visible forms of expression of political, philosophical, or religious belief. The prohibition, which is limited to the wearing of conspicuous large-sized signs, is liable to constitute direct discrimination on the grounds of religion and belief. If it's direct discrimination, then of course you can't justify it. So you couldn't have a policy which says, it's okay to wear a little cross badge on your lapel. I don't have that on this. I have a Lithuanian 
and uh, deliberately, I was in Vilnius yesterday. I have a Lithuanian and Ukrainian flag doing that. But let's pretend that it's, it's okay, it's political. It probably is very political. A little badge like that, if you prohibit that as well as prohibiting the hijab, okay. You can't say, oh, you can have that because it's only, it's only small, right? But you can't wear a hijab because that's a big conspicuous sign. I am a little bit reminded of a very ancient Irish joke from the 19th century where you have the lady of the house who is telling off her maidservant for the wickedness of having become pregnant when she's not married. And she's wagging her finger at the maidservant. Eventually the maidservant says, please, ma'am, it's only a little one. Yeah, it's only a small baby. Well, you can't get away with the small baby. I mean, if you're going to have a prohibition, it's got to be a total prohibition, right? And importantly, the final part of Varba and Miller does allow you to take into account national provisions protecting the freedom of religion if they are more favorable in terms of examining the appropriateness of a difference of treatment. Hey, wait a minute, I thought we had an EU directive. What we're actually saying is, we're interpreting the EU directive in a particular way, but if you have national protect provisions which protect better, you're allowed to apply those provisions. Hmm? Right. <clears throat> By now, you would be forgiven for being rather confused. Certainly, we still have some very confused national courts. Poor national courts, they go on making references. And very specifically, you get the well, you get the religious clothing uh, reference, which is kind of okay, it's there, and it doesn't do very much more. This is case C344 of 20. Uh, this is the only one that went to a chamber of, of uh, five, by the way. And that one, they're saying, well, you know, we've just uh, we've just done Barbara and Miller. So really, we're going to copy paste that it's not direct discrimination, provided your prohibition is applied in a general and undifferentiated way. But you 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 have to make sure uh, also that you don't have provisions of national legislation, which were ensured to in get the directive in transposed into national law, which are construed as meaning that religious belief and philosophical belief are two separate grounds of discrimination. They can't be used as provisions which are more favorable. You have to go back up to the constitutional provisions. Finally, in this stack of cases, most recently in this stack of cases, you have back to the Grand Chamber, you're in case C148 of 22, Commune Dance, uh, which was decided in November of last year. And here we are in a situation, as the name rather implies, we have a municipal authority. The municipal authority is uh, prohibiting in a general and indiscriminate manner. There's an internal rule, but there's a general prohibition on members of the staff from visibly wearing in the workplace any sign revealing philosophical or religious beliefs. That rule can be justified by the desire of the authority to establish, having regard to the context in which it operates, an entirely neutral administrative environment, providing the rule is appropriate, necessary, and proportionate in the light of the context, and taking into account the various rights and interests at stake do you by any chance detect the court putting the problem back on the national court in these cases? Because, you know, the national court has asked for guidance. And it's, is it really getting, is it really getting the help that it needs? This reference, Commune Dos, comes from Belgium, not from France. I'm waiting for the moment when there is a French reference from a municipal authority, which puts the word laicite up there in big, bold, black letters. And we'll see what happens. Now, 
I promised I'd talk a bit about Shechita and Halal as well. I'm going to do it more quickly because I know that a lot of the people who are listening are actually employment lawyers, and those cases are not employment law cases. Uh, I, it's almost a threat. I have been invited uh, by Oke Odudu to write this up for the purposes of the Cambridge Yearbook. And when I do write it up, I will not be short-winded on the subject of Shechita and Halal. We have, we have a League of uh, Mosques case, we have, which is case C426 of 16. We have case C497 of 17, Oeuvre d'assistance aux bêtes d'abattoir. And then we have the Jewish community coming in, in case C336, 19, Centrale Israelitische Consisterie. And that, by the way, also then ends up as a Strasbourg case because it turns the, the, the uh, you end up with the problem, because it's the problem for everyone who, but funnily, the Jew, Jews and Muslims have the same problem, right? About the ritual slaughter of meat. Uh, it ends up in Strasbourg as application 16760 of 22. Executive von the Muslims von Belgi and others against Belgium. What we have going on here is a situation where the community legislator had actually made provision in the detailed rules governing the operation of slaughterhouses. The community legislator had put in a get out clause, which allowed you to have temporary slaughterhouses which didn't have to keep all the standard rules. If they were needed, they could be authorized. And there was also a get out clause so that you didn't have to use mandatory stunning before slaughter if the meat was going to be slaughtered um, for kosher meat or for halal meat. I really will spell you, spare you the detail of the legislation which is the way that veterinary and agricultural legislation is, that is mind-blowingly complicated. So there was a get-out clause. And under the get-out clause, members of the Islamic faith and members of the Jewish faith for a number of years continued happily to get their supplies of meat, whether that was kosher meat to put into your dinner for Shabbat or whether it was being able to invite all your friends for the festival of Eid at the end of Ramadan, when you need much, much more meat for that specific period of time, because it's a big celebration, there wasn't a problem. And then the Flemish community, or remember Belgium is divided, there's the Walloons and the Flemish communities, which makes it all much more complicated as well. The Flemish community decided it was really interested in animal welfare. At least that's what they said. And so they removed from national law the ability to rely on what EU law had expressly protected. Was this okay? Well, it really, I'm not doing it justice, um, but you want to look at the Advocate General's opinions because you get really, really interesting, really thoughtful analysis, for example, in the Israelitish uh, consistory one by A.G. Hogan. The Irish AGs seem very useful in this regard. They seem to get it quite well, that there's a, there is an issue about religious belief and what that implies in terms of how you run your life. The court really, really and truly decides to do things differently. I'm going to take, I can't, haven't got time to talk you through all of them, so I'm going to take the uh, case uh, 33619, Central Israelitish Consistory van Belgi. Uh, it's the Israelitish, but it's also the Union of Mosques in Antwerp, and uh, the, uh, the association that dealt with uh, coordinating festival of Eid stuff. I mean, you know, it was, a, it was a real collaborative venture between the Jewish community and the Muslim community. <coughs> and the court decides that notwithstanding 
that you have this express exemption sitting there in an EU regulation. That, regu that provision does not preclude legislation of a member state which requires, in the context of ritual slaughter, a reversible stunning procedure which cannot result in the animal's death. Now, just pause there for a moment. What you have here is a situation in which the judges are making quite a heavyweight call on religious law. Hmm? Because they are saying, I mean, the, the, the rabbinical opinions, the halakhic opinions, the halal rules, you know, that, that's all a matter for the religious authorities, you would have thought. But what we have here is a situation in which the actually the lay authorities, the CJU, is making an authoritative call on whether reversible stunning is acceptable in religious terms. It's a very interesting line to cross. Should they have been doing that? Should they really have accepted limiting temporary slaughterhouse authorization, authorization which was needed to meet peak festival of Eid demand for meat? I ask the questions openly because I'm not saying for a minute that protecting animal welfare is unimportant. I think it's extremely important. The question is, or why these cases are so difficult is that they are about striking a balance between two things that matter, right? The, the hijab cases are about striking a balance between religious freedom for the employee and the employer's right to run his business profitably. Where do you put that dividing line? How much, how much should the employer be able to say, well, I'm worried in case people get the wrong feeling, so I want to be neutral. And here, absolutely in favor of animal welfare, but should it have gone where it went when the views on reversible stunning, it depends who you read as to whether reversible stunning is or isn't acceptable. Certainly in the more orthodox views are that it is not. So I put all of that out there. I put all of that out there because the derogation that was in the legislation is effectively degutted. It's simply taken away. Now, I'm going to compare that for you, just, just you know, just to be a little bit mischievous. I'm going to compare that with a couple of cases that are in employment law that deal with Christian religion problems and where the court seems much more comfortable in its skin. These cases, these two cases that I'm going to mention now, are Eggenberger, which is case C41416, and case 68 of 17, IR against JQ. By the way, I should have said that in the Human Rights Court, because that is the most recent ruling, and that ruling came through on the 13th of February, 2024, in Executive and the Muslims van Belgi. That was, again, it's, it comes straight out of the decrees in the Flemish region banning the slaughter of animals without pious prior stunning. The national authorities, said the Human Rights Court, had not exceeded their discretion, their margin of appreciation. You'll remember that with the Strasbourg case law, you have a right, you have derogation, you have interference with the right, you have a margin of appreciation for the member state, state signatory to the European Convention. And the ruling was, in making this, in making this uh, change that had happened, the national authorities had not exceeded their discretion They'd taken a measure which was justified as a matter of principle. It could be regarded as proportionate to the aim pursued, namely the protection of animal welfare as an element of public morals. Again, a judgment you know, that needs to be looked at and chewed over carefully. But go, go across now to the Christian context, 
go across to Egenberger and go across to uh, the uh, case IR and JQ. I can never remember initials, which is why I hesitate when I have to quote them. Uh, Egenberger is about a lady who wants a job working for the Protestant uh, churches in Germany. And one of the criteria for applying for the job was that you had to be a signed up member of one of a list of churches. And actually she wasn't, so she didn't get the job. And she said, I don't think this is okay. Please bear in mind <clears throat> that the status of the churches and so on is all protect. The Grundgesetz gets in there in terms of protecting the separation of church and state and the rights of the churches, right? Well, the court was much more deft in how it dealt with it, and it decided this is on genuine, legitimate, and justified occupational requirement, compare and contrast Bugnawi, right? It's that, that provision. That is, has to be a requirement that is necessary and objectively dictated, having regard to the ethos of the church or organization concerned, by the nature of the occupational activity <coughs> concerned, or the circumstances in which it's carried out. It cannot cover considerations which have no connection with that ethos or with the right of autonomy of the church or organization. The requirement must comply with the principle of proportionality. And the National Court is told very firmly, you have to ensure that uh, if you can't apply the applicable national law in conformity with Article 4.2 of the directive, you just disapply the national law. Since Vera Egenberger was not looking for a job working in the diaconate, uh, but she was hoping that she would be uh, doing a job producing a parallel report on the United Nations International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. So it's doing a country report. It would have been doing a country report. On it. This is not mainline mission of the church. This is doing something very good and important, but it's not teaching the doctrine of the church. And the answer was one which was very favorable to the employee. Another answer that's favorable to the employee this time we're talking about the Catholic Church, is IR and JQ. We have a doctor who's a senior doctor. He's working in a Caritas hospital, and oh dear, he is a divorcee. He is the wrong side of Catholic canon law. You're not meant to do that. And the hospital run by Caritas took a very dim view, and they got rid of him. Note, they would not have got rid of a doctor who wasn't a Catholic in the same circumstances, uh, a Catholic and, and, and in a senior post. And so uh, the gentleman in question uh, obviously ran a, ran a court case, and the court was still in the grand chamber, friends. The court tells us that a church or other organization the ethos of which is based on religion or belief and which manages a hospital in the form of a private limited company, cannot decide to subject its employees performing managerial duties to a requirement to act in good faith and with loyalty to that ethos that differs according to the faith or lack of faith of such <clears throat> employees. Without that decision being subject to effective judicial review, second, the difference of treatment is consistent with the directive only if, bearing in mind the nature of the occupational activities concerned or the context in which they're carried out, religion or belief constitutes an occupational requirement that is genuine, legitimate, and justified in the light of the ethos and is consistent with proportionality. Back to the National Court to see all of that. This man is a doctor in a hospital. Again, he's not teaching, he's not giving seminars on Catholic doctrine. He is a doctor working in a hospital. And again, we're told that the national court has got to make sure that you get adequate protection. And if that means disapplying some national law, 
you to supply that national law. I'm feeling very mischievous today, so I'm just going to conclude because here we had cases where national constitutional law is gently being, uh, you know, moved out of the way if necessary. Uh, but we also have the earlier cases, the uh, in the mosque uh, mosque cases, you have the situation where if you can't get the protection under EU law, maybe you can get it under national constitutional law. I'm just going to be really mischievous, and I'm going to remind you about a European arrest warrant case which caused absolute howls of protest from national constitutional courts when the Court of Justice produced its judgment. I am referring, of course, to case C399 of 11, Maloney. In the Grand Chamber, the court says the, the European arrest warrant direct um, framework decision had been amended by common agreement so that it was possible, <coughs> providing certain conditions were observed, you could try somebody in absentia. Mr. Maloney was tried in absentia in accordance with those provisions. A warrant for his arrest was issued. The Spanish constitution said, we don't surrender people if they've been tried in absentia. The court said, oh yes, you do. I am going to suggest as a final, final comment really on what I've been talking about. I think that there is, that there are some problems there because I think that there is, despite everything that this particular former advocate general tried to write both in her formal opinion in Bugnawi and in the shadow opinion in Vaba and Müller, I think there is genuinely not as much understanding as would be desirable of how non-Christian religions operate. And for that reason, there's a kind of blind spot. There's a kind of blind spot. The European Union's motto is united in diversity. As we all know, I feel a little bit that we have in these cases a missed opportunity to uphold as a core EU value a different motto, which would be tolerance for diversity. Thank you very much.